we're going to jump straight into um, this uh, plenary, uh, which is Global Struggles. Uh, with us, we have uh, uh, the four folks, uh, Marcella, who's here, Oliver with the Bolivarian uh, Water Rights Project. Uh, we have Jeribo here with the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. Uh, Pierre Labussier with the Haiti Action Committee. And uh, Brother uh, Clarence Thomas, the real Clarence Thomas, as you say. <laughs> uh, with the Million Worker March uh, and the ILWU Local 10. Hello. Um, well, good afternoon, and thank you very much to Cal Lee and all the people who made possible um, for me to be here today. I'm very, very honored and, and very happy to, um, to share what happened this morning. Um, I felt like pretty, pretty much like at home because that's the way that we, that we you know, reclaim our rights and mobilizing. Anyway, um, I'm going to start uh, to, I would like to share an experience that we had almost 10 years ago in, in my town in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And I wanted to start with that, um, that quote uh, from a press release um, from January 2000, which I think it's, it's very important. Um, it's very important for the, all the struggles that we are living and facing right now. Um, that little quote um, for us opened um, a series of events um, and it was a turning point in the Bolivian history and in the fight for, for, the, for the people to reclaim the water. So since many other 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 Bolivian country other Latin American countries we have been facing um what it's called the structural adjustment programs um that's that meant for us the all the companies that were belong to the state, meaning the people, suddenly they were sold to foreign corporations. And, um, and um, um, this process was promoted by the World Bank and the IMF um, mainly. Um, and um, this um, picture is from, um, from the struggle that we had in 2000. Also, and because there was a second wave of the privatization in in the 90s, and when when the government, because there wasn't anything else for sale, they decide to 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 sell our water. So in 1999, you can see all those um, politicians um, signing the concession of our water system to this. Uh, very large, um, it was a consortium, but the main holder was this very large um, transnational, U.S. transnational called Bechtel, whose headquarters is, is in, in San Francisco. And that, you know, after, um, after what happened in Cochabamba, they were also very, very involved in the, what they call the rebuild Iraq, because they got also very, very, con several contracts there with the U.S. government. Um, Anyway, uh, it was not just that they were expropriating our water system. Uh, the privatization went uh, beyond that because they uh, started, um, they also um, approved a legislation on water that um, took all the water rights of the people and they were given to the transnational, to the corporation. Uh, so people suddenly that, you know, people that had wells in their backyards, suddenly those wells didn't belong to them, they belonged to the corporation. Um, farmers that work with, um, you know, irrigation systems and for years and years have been managing these um, water sources, uh, suddenly they, you know, these rivers or streams and uh, lakes, they didn't belong to them anymore, they belonged to the corporation and they had to pay for the right to use to use the water. Um, um, yeah, we can go to the next one. So anyway, we start to mobilize. We decided that that wasn't going to happen to us. And, um, and we created this large coalition of organizations, environmental organizations, unions, indigenous people, um, 
professionals, um, you know, many, many, you know, people who were uh, self-employed. And um, under this coalition, we started to a series of mobilizations in Cochabamba. And that uh, at the beginning were very peaceful, uh, but uh, they had a very strong response from from the government. So the governments put on the streets first the police and later the army. Um, anyway, um, that's what happened in, in February in 2000. And after a, two days of mobilizing, that become, became very violent because more than uh, 200 people were severely injured. The government decided to create a commission uh, to study the contract that they signed with this transnational and also to make um, to make to review the legislation that was approved. We consider this um, like a victory. We said, okay, at least we have a, a, a door that was open for the government to uh, review what happened with the with the privatization. Um, but. Um, um, nothing happened after two months. Uh, we realized that the government was just trying to gain some time and making feel the people tired of mobilizing. And um, and we in April, um, Radica. <laughs> um, in April, um, two months after after that, we decided that was enough, and we called uh, to a huge uh, mobilization called the Last Battle. And we said uh, on that time, or we, you know, we win this time, or they, you know, or we lose. There's no other choice for us. So this thing that started with little mobilization, suddenly we had like 80,000 people on the streets. Uh, and this time, uh, the government decided not just to put the police on the streets, but also the army. Uh, we mobilized for more than a week, and the government declared uh, martial law. Um, um, several people were injured this time. There wasn't any um, possibility for us to talk with the government, and the government didn't want to talk uh, with us either. And um, as a result of this, um, um, you know, after a week of confrontations and 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 you know everything that was shut down in the city. Uh, and after um, a person, uh, a, a person who was also um, severely injured and later died, uh, an 18-year-old uh, Victor Hugo Daza, um, young man that was on the streets, also uh, that was killed by a sharpshooter, um, the government decided that okay, the corporation had to leave, and uh, they left. And um, the government also decided that we were going to uh, make changes in the law and things return to normal. Um, what happened here, and you know what we consider um, at the end, that was uh, that was um, a victory because um, at some point, um, can you put the next slide, Radhika? At some, at some point, you know, the people were not just asking the corporation to leave, but people were demanding the government to leave because the government wasn't responding to the people. Uh, what we realized is that we won not just we, we didn't just recover the right to water, uh, but we recovered also um, the right to be heard. Uh, the right to decide about, uh, you know, natural resources like the water. Uh, we recovered uh, the right to participate and 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 be part of the decision making in our country. And uh, you know, 10 years later, when we look uh, back at what happened in in April 2000, we realize that we have opened a door. Um, for the Bolivians, because after that, Bolivians start to reclaim all their rights, you know, like the right to cult cultivate coca leaves, the right to chew coca leaves, um, the right to decide about what was going on with the gas and the oil in our country. Um, and in 2003, for example, when the government decided to sell our oil and gas, people were again mobilizing on the streets, and this time, um, you know, the government had to resign because um, people, you know, just were so upset and reclaiming um, these rights that we earned in 2000 that the government had to resign and leave, and, and that's what happened. Um, anyway, I want to... 
I wanna I wanna finish uh, saying that you know going back at the beginning again um, to tell you that uh, nothing is is gonna be given to us that we really have to be in permanent mobilization for what do we want and no right was won in a in a you know peaceful battle sometimes we have to be uh, we have to be in the streets and sometimes we have to be in the front and sometimes we lose people uh, but it seems for us like that's the only way and um, and um I think what happened with um with a uh, in April 2000 for us um uh it opened you know a long road for the Bolivians to build democracy and a democracy where you know politicians and the government are there to serve to the people and not vice versa not to the other way uh so I thank you very much for listening to me and I hope this was you know, a little inspiration for the struggles you are facing also here. Thank you. Uh, I want to make it <clears throat> known that Dribble corrected me. Uh, so we're going to break up the order. <laughs> um, and we're going to move now to uh, uh, Clarence next to speak and then come back with Pierre and finish up with Jeribu, all right? For those who don't know me, um, I'm known in the labor movement as the real Clarence Thomas, and my wife, who is my comrade in arms and my advisor and greatest critic, was the person responsible for giving me that title. Uh, let me first of all say that uh, I'm going to try to keep my remarks short because I don't know about you, but when I'm hungry, I don't want to hear a lot of talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to make my remarks as to the point as possible. I want to thank the U.S. Human Rights Network for inviting me here. And I must say that when I was invited, D12, which I'm sure everybody knows about now, and if you don't know, that's the historic action that's going to take place on Monday, uh, had not yet hit the radar screen, and I thought that my attendance here today, I would be speaking a lot about what happened on November the 2nd. Um, but uh, history waits for none of us. And uh, this is a time of great movement, some of which is much not anticipated, especially by the ruling class, and also by the uh, officialdom of labor, but very quickly, just to make the connection between human rights and workers' rights, I'd like to just give you a little information about my union, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. I'm a member of Local 10. And for those of you who don't know anything about what longshoremen do, we are responsible for the loading and unloading of uh, maritime cargo. Uh, we are some of the most important workers in the world because those of you in the room right now, you're probably either wearing something or sitting on something or holding something in your hand that comes off of a ship. Some of the first organized workers of color in this country were black longshore workers in the South. And one of the reasons why we could look at the importance of longshore workers is because in order for the capitalists to get the cargo off of the ship, to be able to get it to the consumer, it has to be handled by workers. The ILWU is a story of a union. It concerns workers of all races and beliefs who come together with one single purpose, to achieve a better life for themselves and their families. It is the story of and history of a union with a record on the issue of economic and social justice that is unprecedented, in my opinion. One of the key elements of that history and story is this, that a union that is democratic, militant, and dedicated to the idea that solidarity with workers and other unions is the key to achieving economic security and a peaceful world. 
workers' rights are human rights. We have a slogan in our union that goes like this, an injury to one is an injury to all. We take that slogan very seriously. Solidarity cost you something. In 19, late 1930s, there was a community picket line that was erected in San Francisco by people who were against the rising tide of fascism. We did not cross that community picket line. And we stopped the movement of scrap iron to Japan. We were one of the first unions to oppose the Korean War, the Vietnamese War. But more importantly, the union understands that it's one thing to be a union official. It's another thing to be a union, to be a labor leader. And what that essentially means is that trade unions have a responsibility not only to their membership, but to the entire working class. When we look at what's going on today with the emergence of the Occupy movement. One of the things that is most interesting about that movement is that that movement is independent. It is unconnected to the Republican and Democratic parties, which has a strong shackle hold on organized labor. Oh yes, we got Republicans in the uh, labor movement. Some might say that the Democratic Party represents the right, and the Republicans represent the extreme right. I'm just going to call it and tell it like it is. As we witness this movement of young people and rank and file union members, with respect to the mobilization of people to the most significant areas of industry in the country, and that is the maritime ports right now. One of the things that's most unique about that is that the leadership of the ILWU is not supporting this movement. But when you look at the history of the ILWU, Historically, we have been the ones that have shut down ports. But now it's not the union that's moving to shut down the ports. It's the community. And while there are some who would want to create the impression that somehow those ports belong to the ILWU and to the bosses, let me remind everyone that those ports belong to the people. Those are public ports. When people talk about this Occupy movement as being having, it's, it's aimless, it doesn't have any real direction, what are their demands? Well, I don't think that you can find any more clear demands than those actions that in fact challenge capital. The only way that working people gain any real attention and leverage with the ruling class and the bosses is when we exercise our leverage as workers, either by withholding our labor, sitting in, picketing, civil disobedience. There are those who say, well, what about the 99% that are going to be inconvenienced and stop from being able to work? on December the 12th. My response to that is, I'm sure there were people who were inconvenienced during the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> Let's, this is the American way for, for wage and struggle. I'm sure that there were those who were inconvenienced during the Montgomery bus, bus boycott. And we know how many people were inconvenienced, especially those in the Civil Rights Movement, 
when Dr. King began to make the association between U.S. imperialism and capitalism and the war at home. There are those who want to fight right now and those who don't. But I submit to you that those that don't want to fight, get out the way. This is a movement that is going to happen whether or not you like it or not. And I kind of like look at it in this respect. We all have had incidences in our family where there is a baby that is about to be born and it's a surprise. What do we do? The baby's on the way. We're going to love that baby, no matter how much it might be a surprise and an inconvenience. And I submit to you that that's what this Occupy movement is about, and I'm going to close on those remarks. Thank you so much for your attention. All power to the people. Thank you so much, and enjoy your meal. <laughs> All right, I want to bring up uh, Pierre. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. This is a wonderful day, beautiful day. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this on the U.S. Human Rights Network. This is so important that too many times we've been struggling or we struggle in a compartmentalized way. Each one in our little corner. I do women's rights. I don't do human rights, so I do... As one, one brother said to me back in 1991 when the coup d'etat took place against the people of Haiti. And I went to him, I said, brother, you're involved in Central America. Let's mobilize the forces in support of Haiti, you know, because the source of the coup in Haiti was the Bush administration, the Elliot Abrams, and those people. And he told me, I do Central America, I don't do Haiti. <laughs> You know, this is the kind of stuff too often that we hear. Sometimes we have so many brothers and sisters who are in the jails here, who are political prisoners. Some of them have been in, incarcerated for the past 40 years. Yet we have people in the movement saying, well, I do something else. I take care of um, or Africa or Haiti, and I don't, I don't want to deal with that. And I say, how can you be advocating for brothers and sisters who are incarcerated in Africa or in Haiti, and yet you're not advocating for Mumia Abu Jamal, or, or, or Leonard Peltier, or Chip Fitzgerald, and so many others? And so this is why I really love this idea, or this organization, this network, because we need it. We need to connect our struggles. I'm from Haiti originally. I'm a member of the Haiti Action Committee, and so I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank the U.S. Uh, Human Rights Network and so many of the organizations that have been in solidarity with our sisters and brothers in Haiti. This year, we saw a major victory when the people come together, we can make things happen. President Aristide, the leader of the people of the grassroots movement in Haiti, was taken, kidnapped out of Haiti by the French, the Canadians, and the U.S., the Bush administration. We brought him back after seven years of struggle, seven years of resistance. And I thank each and every one of you for standing with the people of Haiti. I know there was a lot of confusion about whether Brother Aristide truly represented the people's movement and what have you. All of that originated from the State Department because what do they do? They misrepresent our leaders, as Bob Marley says, and make us sit on the sidelines and watch them being taken out each and every time. And they feed us lies, 
and a whole bunch of nonsense about it. I've had people who claim to be leftist. Mm -mm. Now we got to be very uh -oh. careful because the CIA doesn't come at us looking in a three-piece suit and, and talking right-wing stuff. They come at us dressed as hippies. They come at us with dreadlocks. They come at us with a big T-shirt with Che Guevara on it or Fidel Castro. They come at us looking that way. They come at us speaking more Marxist than Marx himself. That's how they put together the disguise to make us turn away from each other. And so the people of Haiti, who many say are illiterate, for the most part they are, but literacy is a skill. It doesn't mean you don't have a brain or you're not an intellectual. An intellectual means somebody who uses their intellect to look at their environment and see what's going on and how to make sense out of, out of the chaos and the mayhem. And so our people, somebody once said in the Bible, the great revolutionary Jesus said, blessed are those who are illiterate for they do not read the New York Times. <laughs> now I don't know there was the New York Times in Jesus' time, but I'll take that because it makes sense. That's why you see the grassroots in Haiti, the grassroots in Haiti who do not read the New York Times yet, they are the ones who leave the misery, the oppression of the elite, the oppression of that 1%, they are the 99% the whose foremothers and forefathers were kidnapped from Africa, who were made to work from can't see in the morning till can't see at night, in the words of Malcolm X, who have been decimated. What you see, to, they are the ones who know exactly what's going on, and they say, no matter what the New York Times says, I'm sticking for myself and I'm standing up, I'm the one who's going to choose who my representative, my spokesperson, my, spoke, my, my, my people are going to be to represent me. Brothers and sisters, what you are saying in Haiti is exactly what's going on every place else in every land, including right here in LA, in Oakland. It's that little elite that takes us away, that wants to take away all of our rights, including the right to grow our own food, including the, the giving us seed that, uh, that's genetically modified so that we cannot use what normally farmers do all the time. They want to privatize everything, meaning they want to just plunder, just like the conquistadors. And so the people of Haiti have been standing up and fighting against it. So I want to thank you and to urge your continued support to be in solidarity with each other. As Brother Clarence Thomas said earlier, the great motto the, of, of the ILWU, I'm a former ILWU myself. An injury to one is an injury to all. This is so important. That's why the, the ILWU stood up when the struggle against apartheid was going on in South Africa. They stood up and shut down the ports because they say when they do that to our sisters and brothers in South Africa, they are doing it to us. They stood up and refused to unload cargo coming from El Salvador because they could relate to the struggle of the people of El Salvador and they could stop the machine. They made the connections. The bosses practice international solidarity with each other yes, they do. more times than we, right. who are supposed to be progressive, practice it with each other. We got to change this. I will close by telling you that the movement today headed by President Aristide, known as the Lavalas movement, which means the cleansing flood. That movement has its roots way back to Africa, way back to the days of the conquistadors when our foremothers and forefathers were resisting slavery, resisting oppression, and fighting. Together, they did the impossible. They defeated the mighty armies of Napoleon, Britain, and Spain. Our foremothers and forefathers from Africa understood that solidarity is what mattered when they invited Brother Simon Bolivar to come to Haiti 
to receive, he received political asylum. He landed in my hometown. I used to go swim in the sea right by the spot where he landed. So I grew up bathed in the water of solidarity. <laughs> and Brother Simon Bolivar went back twice with Haitian volunteers who gave him, Haiti gave him ships, ammunition, and volunteers to fight against Spanish colonialism. On the second try, he, su he was successful. Haiti supported the movement for Greek independence back in the 1820s. See, you won't see that in the media because they want to demonize our people when they stand up and fight. They want to present black people as if, well, we, we were brought out of, we were savages and stuff. Same way they demonize us, they demonize, they present us the Western movies that shows our brothers, indigenous brothers and sisters as, as wild beasts and savages. That's the game they play. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for being here with you today. Our people are continuing to fight. Don't be confused when you see the United Nations in Haiti and you see that beautiful bird of peace. They have committed so many massacres in Haiti. They have committed at least five that I know of between 2005 and 2007. We have it on video. I have the evidence right here on video of those various massacres that they have committed. And it is shameful that the person who headed that killing machine in Haiti was none other than socialist Lula. I know some of you may not like what I'm saying, but I'm going to tell you because it's the truth. Lula, who's a socialist who, in Brazil, is the one who was acting like the pit bull of the Bush administration in killing brothers and sisters in Haiti. And we have it on, on, on DVD as proof of that. That's what I was talking about earlier, about be careful of labels. Watch what the person does, not the label of socialist or this or that. Are they real with the people and are, are they standing with people? So um, right now the UN forces the struggle. Our people are continuing to struggle in Haiti. The UN forces are there. They have brought cholera against our people. We have Bill Clinton who is saying all these beautiful things about taking care of the people of Haiti, but that's not occurring. Our people, more close to a million people, are still living under tents, shit cities. So our people are standing up. My time is up. I get too excited and emotional when I start about this because there is so much that people don't know. But um, thank you so very much for your support. Aluta continua. The, that is the history of this empire. If we are clear and if we tell the truth, it began with the rape, the plunder, and the murder of indigenous people who were killed Columbus style when he discovered already breathing people, and then it was shored up and supported by the breathing cargo brought across on the ships. So there's no history of wages. There's no history of benefits. There's there's no history of shared profit. There's only the history of 400 years plus of free labor. And then now we're in, we're in a, a sort of haze, a historical haze, where we buy into this notion of welfare queens and welfare fraud and, and, and the imposter Clarence Thomas badmouthing his sister who took care of his aunt that raised both of them, quit her job to do that, and he, like the shuffle along trade that he is started bad mouthing his own flesh and blood. So that is what we have. That's what we have. The question is, what are we going to end up with? First, we got to acknowledge what we have. Some of us, you know, and, and I and I love a, a nice Black History calendar. I love it when I see George Washington Carver, Phyllis Wheatley, who was a bad poet, by the way. You know, she wasn't just hid away in the White House. I love a calendar where I can see Malcolm X on the calendar. I can see Sojourner. You know, black history time. I love it. I love it when Kwanzaa comes up. I love it when King Day follows. Black History Month, one month, shortest month of the year. Love it. 
caught up just like you in the euphoria. Who knew that my grandchildren would be alive, would be born to see, and I would still be here, to see the first African-American president. I'm, I, I'm loving it, but, but look, slap yourself. <laughs> slap yourself, come out of it, come out of it. It doesn't matter who's president of the empire. Come out of it. Snap out of your haze. Stop your disappointment and your demoralization. Oh, we thought he was going to ride in and save us. We thought he was going to check and balance the, br the rotten, broke-down system that his ancestor came from as well. Delusional? Yeah. Yeah, that's what privilege and false sense of power will do for you. Yeah, he's delusional, no question. But then so is everybody else who thinks that he was brought to save us and that he's going to be able to do so much. We are living in a period, a period of unresolved issues from the auction block to the fields, sugar cane and cabbage. Unresolved issues from Colombia, dripping with blood mixed with Coke is it. Unresolved issues from Charleston Five to the True Temper Nine who worked 45 years before they saw a black foreman or a black anybody other than those on the assembly line. We're living in a period where Tyson's does commercials that say feeding you like family and then rips off the wages of our brown brothers and sisters and our black brothers and sisters and forces workers like Ricky Woodall into addiction, into homelessness because he filed an OSHA complaint and they fired him. And that is when the Mississippi Worker Center was born. And for those of you who recall the history of the Southern Human Rights Organizers Conference, I see Loretta's here, I see Fia, I see Saladin, many of the people who helped to bring that movement to a head and bring it forward, the first domestic human rights conference, the first domestic human rights conference, rightfully so, was held in the Deep South. And during that hearing, during that conference, we learned about the struggle of Ricky Woodall, who called his boss in, it went into his boss's office after getting his diagnosis from his doctor. And his doctor told him that he had a precancerous nostril infection and that he needed to work with chemicals that were safe, as if there are such a thing. Water-based solutions, good luck with that. When you can't even get to see a material safety data sheet, you don't know what you're working with. So what? So Ricky, like many of us, believed in a new day. He believed, okay, I'm gonna go to him. I found this out, I'm gonna go to my boss, and I'm gonna let my boss know, and surely he's gonna make this accommodation for me. I can just see Ricky going, pretty much the way Dred Scott went, okay? And said, I'm on free soil, I should be free now. I'm gonna throw those tidbits in every now and then just to keep you on your feet keep you checking now. So Ricky went to his boss, his boss said, okay, yeah, 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 get back to work. Three weeks later, Ricky's at the, at the plant, at the work table having nosebleeds. The boss is coming over, wiping it up, saying, you know, you're gonna have to cut this out. But he told them what his condition was. So Ricky filed an anonymous OSHA complaint. The day that OSHA came into the workplace at Tyson's, just outside Jackson, Mississippi, the day the OSHA rep came in to inspect was the last day of Ricky's employment. He was fired while the OSHA inspector was on the premises. That's what we mean when we say we need a change. That's what we mean when we say we need worker power. We don't need any more gatekeepers. And the 501c3 system is a movement crusher. All of us, including our organization, use that money. Now we thought we were using the money as reparations. We thought it was money we were owed and we deserved for the way we've been treated in this country. Those of us descendants of kidnapped people, those of us who came here on, on a false sense of, of the American dream after your country was plundered. Oh, we understand why you would come and live in the snow in Minnesota when you could be under a palm tree drinking natural, unprocessed, unchemically polluted fruit, eating vegetables that are not chemicalized. 
But what happened to our brothers and sisters, what makes them run here, and in your deluded mind, you're going to hear somebody say, well, it's the best country on earth. No wonder they're coming. That makes you crazier than anybody if you believe that, and then don't peddle that. Just keep it to yourself. If that is your, if that's what you believe, that brothers and sisters who come from a land where the sun always shines, want to wear snow boots and throw on scarves and hats and coats and be beat down by cold weather and bad jobs, if that's what you think people are coming here for, they came here because you can't live in a country that's been raped and plundered. And then when we say no Coke products, people look at us like we're crazy. We've shut down conferences. We've said, look, take the Coke products off the table. In our contract for our conference, every time we negotiate, we say no Coke products. And we let them know Pepsi for now, but we'll keep you posted. Because you know things change. Walmart, let's stand in solidarity with Betty Dukes and the other sisters who were shot down by Clarence and the others. The U.S. Supreme Court couldn't find commonality. Common, now what? I got something in common. I'm a woman, and I'm being paid less than a man, and there's about a million point five of me. How much more common, lawyers in the room, how much more common can it be? It's typical. It's typical because women get paid 73 cents on every dollar. So why isn't there typicality? Why wasn't there commonality? You even have lawyers going around because they were educated the way they were, saying, well, I can see their point. I can't see the point. And I urge you not to see it. I urge you to beat the point to death, okay? PV Sound in Meridian, Mississippi, beats up workers. And yet you go to church, and that's the speaker you see in most of the churches, P-E-A-V-E-Y. Tell your pastors not to do it. Hyatt, better put them on standby. Better check, get a list. There are Hyatts that you shouldn't stay in. America's Catch in Belzoni, Mississippi. North of Grumman, even though we beat them back, the Black Workers for Justice and Eagles Workers for Justice beat them all the way back. They got a zero tolerance now policy against making nooses and drawing swastikas in the workplace. Who knew? Zero tolerance against attempted lynchings. Who knew in the 21st century that that was going to be going on? But when we filed against them under the leadership of groups like Black Workers for Justice and Ingalls Workers for Justice, the horrific photographs and images that people told us about were just unbelievable and not to be believed. Subway workers who can't have lunch on the premises can serve sandwiches, and then we learned they have to take their sandwiches, buy them, of course, can't get them free, take them out to their car and eat them after work. All day long you serving food, and you can't have a sandwich on the boss with the low wages that you're being paid. So I saw my sign over there, and I'm going to try to be disciplined because I hate it when people go over and miss my time. So I'm going to try to be disciplined. But if I could just take one more minute to just wrap this up by talking about the types of strategies that we need to employ. We need to get rid of the myth that the Internet is going to be our salvation. Get back out in the street, go door to door, talk to somebody, hello, feel their warm breath on your face when you have a conversation with somebody, and stop just texting, and stop just emailing. If we ever are going to make revolution, we'd like to talk to somebody. All power to the people, the righteous people, the real people.